And it's in the breaking We come on And it's in the giving We Welcome to A Medicinal Mind, Wisdom and Well-Being, a podcast dedicated to the telling of authentic stories and the sharing of insightful wisdom, exploring science and spirituality, medicine and mother nature. No topic is off limits when it comes to growing our personal understanding and supporting our collective well-being. With your host, Dr. Rob Abbott, a family medicine resident practicing spiritually focused and evolutionarily informed functional medicine. We hope to nourish your being so that you can flourish in whatever the moment has called for you to do. In episode 15 of A Medicinal Mind, Wisdom and Well-Being, we explore the interface between science and spirituality, evolution and creationism, faith, and the experimental method. I have a wonderful conversation with a dear friend, an honorary family member, former governor of North Carolina, and nurturing grandfather, Dr. Jim Martin. Jim is a Princeton PhD organic chemist who initially taught at his alma mater, Davidson College. During that time, he played principal tuba in the Charlotte Symphony, and officiated high school football. Drawn to politics as a precinct worker, he was then elected three times as county commissioner, six times to the U.S. Congress, and twice as governor of North Carolina. After 26 years of public service, he returned to his scientific roots and private life to serve as vice president of medical research at Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. He and his wife, Dottie, have three children and five grandchildren, in addition to being amazing family friends to my grandparents and all the Abbots and my loving family. In our conversation today, Jim shares some amazing insights regarding the complexities of biology, organic chemistry, and physics as they relate to the current existence of humanity and our universe as a whole. In distilling down some of the major ideas in his groundbreaking book, Revelation Through Science, Jim provides us with a small glimpse into some foundational scientific principles that perhaps do not and will never prove the existence of a God, but do indeed provide evidence for the existence of a larger creator. Introducing the concepts of irreducible complexities the remarkable relational geometry of DNA, RNA, sugars, and amino acids, we explore the miraculous machinery that allows for the storage and interpretation of our genetic code and the eventual creation of an incredible array of proteins and biologic tissues. Getting a little geeky, we, as two chemists, Explore the concepts of chirality, or handedness, of molecules. Why should we care if something is left-handed or right-handed? And what does it mean to be left-handed in the first place? And what the heck is an enantiomer? Changing gears, James and I explore scripture and the biblical text. Can we treat the Bible as a scientific textbook? Or is it a book of relational and interpretive wisdom? Is it fair to judge the Bible against our current understanding of the scientific method? Dancing into the beautiful trinity of sugars, RNA and DNA, and amino acids, Jim creates the wonderful three-way chicken, egg, and creator conundrum. What came first? Nucleic acids? Or ribose and deoxyribose? or amino acids, or perhaps something we don't even currently understand. I am so grateful to Jim for sharing this space with me. 
and engaging in a thoughtful discussion seeking to bring peace to the supposed dichotomy between science and spirituality, providing a middle ground for individuals to recognize that we can both believe in God and evolution, use the scientific method, and rely on our faith for understanding. And please, check out Jim's book, Revelation Through Science. It really is a fascinating collection of thoughtful scientific inquiry, accessible to both the rigorous scientist and curious layperson. You can find links to Jim's page and his book in our show notes, as well as slides describing some of the concepts we discuss in this podcast. For those, like myself, who are rather visually inclined, I really hope you enjoy the show. Hey, Jim, thank you so much for coming on the show and for sharing a conversation with me. It feels a little odd that we're actually doing this on the computer. I'm so used to being able to be with you in person, but I really wanted you to come on to talk well, about... Thank you for, uh, for arranging it. This is the first time I've tried this particular technology for a conversation. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, I... By the way, Dr. Abbott. Well, thank you. I'm doing really, really well. And I'm impressed that you're willing to uh, play around with this kind of technology. I'm, I'm impressed day in, day out by my grandparents and uh, your guys' generation for being willing to to want to play around with some of these toys. <laughs> well, I'll try to represent the octogenarian generation as well as I can. I'm <laughs> saying body and me. Well, thank you. Um, so, you know, I, we're having this conversation today mainly because I think you have some incredible ideas that you managed to piece together in a book. <laughs> and some of these ideas just really blew my world. And I thought it would be a great conversation to have with our audience to really perhaps give them some new ways of thinking about science, spirituality, religion. And you know, but before we dig into some of the, the details, the ideas in the book, I would love for you to just let people know a little bit about you and who you are and, and perhaps a little about your spiritual background as a child and um, through the, the many years of your life. Well, I don't know how interesting it'll be, but I'll, I'll tell you, I was born in Savannah, Georgia. My dad was a Presbyterian minister. And uh, when I was uh, young, about two years old, we moved to Winsboro, South Carolina, and I grew up in the Presbyterian manse. Uh, not only was I a preacher's kid, but uh, also my mother was a preacher's wife. And that's a big part of the story because uh, she made sure that uh, her four boys knew where they're supposed to be on Sunday morning. And uh, we uh, sometimes would sneak over next door to the church and practice on the piano or even the organ had a nice uh, pipe organ there and uh we played ping pong and uh, enjoy the facilities but the main thing is uh i guess for our purposes here on on this uh, particular discussion is that uh, probably i uh, missed out on the experience of many young people my age at the time of going through a period of doubt and uh, hopefully coming out uh, on the other side, because uh, Model Martin uh, didn't particularly uh, have much to do with doubt, and uh, her boys weren't supposed to go through that. Yeah. <laughs> Just out on that uh, growth opportunity, but I've tried to to stay with it. Uh, so we're lifelong Presbyterians. Uh, I went to graduate school at uh, after graduating from Davidson College, went to Princeton University where your dad had been an undergraduate and I uh, got my doctorate in chemistry with a study of a particular reaction and the three-dimensional aspect of it. It was a lot of fun. We got it done. But one of the things I noticed there more than I had at Davidson was that most scientists didn't uh, want to talk much about religion. Either they were atheists and keeping it to themselves or they were uh, Christian or some other faith and kept that to themselves. It's hard to say. It was as if they were, if they were uh, believers, 
uh, they didn't want to let on and uh, uh, seemed, seemed to feel that uh, that would not be something you would be willing to share with your colleagues. Well, that was unfortunate. A couple of exceptions, but uh, then I went back to Davidson to teach and saw some of that, but not as, uh, as prevalent as it had been. But while I was at uh, graduate school, one of my professors, Everett Wallace, who taught synthetic organic chemistry, would uh, tease us students a little bit with uh, problems that he would discuss that uh, didn't have a ready answer. This wasn't based on what we did not know in science, but what we did know. And in particular, the three-dimensional geometry of organic compounds, just about all of those that are biologically active are asymmetric. Just like your your hands, or you have a right hand and a left hand, they're mirror images of each other. You can take a look at them and see that that's true. And uh, yet, if you uh, hold them palms down, you see the thumbs point in opposite directions. So they're not they're not superimposable. Well, the same thing's true of uh, organic chemicals. Uh, the molecules that are physiologically active generally are complex and asymmetric like that. And we don't find both left and right, but uh, almost always just the right-handed form or just the left-handed form. And as, as I thought about that, uh, uh, he, he would lead us down a path and uh, make us think, well, how did it get to be that way? And you'll find in my book that uh, that's one of the main features that I introduced there that has not been uh, developed by other authors. We've had books by astronomers and physicists, by biologists. Uh, we've had books by theologians on the subject, but generally no discussion of uh, the complexity of organic molecules. And so uh, in summary of, uh, of biographical nature, that sort of shows you how I got from playing ping pong next door at the church to uh, wondering about these things and six years ago deciding to see if I could write a book about it, which now is in print, uh, Revelation Through Science. The point of that meaning being that uh, science is a modern mode of revelation for us. Uh, to show us how God did some of these uh, marvelous things. Uh, either the, the astronomer's version of the Big Bang, which fairly well tracks uh, the Genesis 1-1, uh, to the uh, interesting coincidence of uh, physical constants being so finely tuned for life. And I discuss that in the book and have chapters on astronomy, physics, biology, geology, and the fossil record and how that's interpreted. But then uh, as the most uh, novel or uh, original part of the book is a discussion of these organic molecules and their complex structures and how their spatial arrangements are vital to how they work. And that's a new level of uh, revelation through that particular branch, my branch of science. So there you have it. Hope that's interesting. Yeah, it was the perfect introduction. It's, it's like you were reading my mind. You know, we didn't actually talk before starting this podcast, but you, you just introduced all the big ideas I was kind of hoping to address in our podcast. And I, I was really touched by that story that you described here in brief of, you know, I didn't go through that period of doubt and come out on the other side, like traveling through the darkness to discover this light, discover this faith or this truth. And, you know, I, I was like, um, I was the opposite, right? I was more of one of those individuals who did go through one of those journeys and had a period of very, scientific reductionist thinking and there wasn't really space for much faith or um you know a christian faith in my life and i uh and i resonate and understand like that seems to be more of the common narrative than 
you know, I, like yours, I, I was just, I had this, there was no period of doubt for me, but um, I was still able to generate these questions through the help of some of my colleagues and, and friends. So I just, I really resonated hearing that authentic story and, uh, and the title of the book itself packed within those three words is so mind blowing to me, revelation through science. It's a concept I had not really ever thought about before and until our, our conversations and seeing the book, but the fact that science itself is a form of modern revelation. I think that's a quote from your book and I would love for you to maybe expand how that idea came about or perhaps who planted that seed and why that became such a big part of this book. Well, uh, let, let me uh, make this point. Uh, there's, there's some would say that uh, other than an individual relationship, God stopped speaking to us uh, 1,600, uh, 1,700, 1,800 years ago when the Bible was written. Uh, others would say uh, that would be advanced to uh, Muhammad. But I'm saying that God still speaks to us, not only in those personal ways, but by allowing us to develop these scientific uh, approaches where we can dig more deeply into nature and see things more clearly as to how they might have happened and how they are arranged and get us to think about that as a way of revealing the, uh, the creative power of God to us. If we, and there's Dottie saying hi to Rob as she goes by. <laughs> uh, yep. Uh, so we're, we're able to develop instruments that can examine nature in ways that we can't see with just our unaided eyes. And this has opened to us a deeper knowledge of the complexity of life, the complexity of nature. And in doing so, it reveals to us as a revelation that life is far too complex for us to uh, imagine that it just happened by unguided chance. Now, in, in a way, we were talking about going through doubt. It, it, there's a parallel here in the way in which uh, scientists have, as a community, gone through an age, a period, a long period of rising doubt that now I think can be countered. What I'm saying is uh, that with the theory of uh, evolution from Charles Darwin, uh, about 160 years or so ago, scientists began to wonder, well, if, if we could have natural selection account for the favoritism of one life form over another, then maybe there's no need for God. And many scientists uh, began to accept that view. And some as agnostics, not knowing what to believe, others as atheists, believing that there is no God and need be and can be no God behind all of this. That was a little easier to do, to make that argument when we were dealing with uh, fossil structures and, and the anatomy of uh, living species. Uh, because it, it, uh, we could look at it and we could see these forms and we could see there were changes and as uh, Huxley and others would argue, if you uh, have this mechanism for the evolution of different species, then why would there be a need of any uh, deity, any, anything beyond what we just see? And then when uh, Watson and Crick developed this concept of the helical structure of DNA, confirmed Darwin's theory. Darwin mainly was uh, presenting a, an explanation of how the selection took place over long periods of time. He called it natural selection. And he paralleled that to artificial selection by uh, people who breed 
dogs or pigeons or whatever. And, and, and he did not know how the change took place. He had no idea, had no mechanism for the changes. Well, this new concept of DNA containing this vast code of information being the genetic uh, carrier of our uh, inherited uh, information about our bodies and, and how, they, how they function, that provides a mechanism for Darwin's evolution concept. And, and, and so that's very important. But at the same time that it validates Darwin by showing a molecular mechanism, it also reveals to us such great profound complexity that we can see that it is so complex that it could not have happened, as I said a moment ago, by unguided chance. There, there had to be some, uh, some purpose for this to have happened. Now, I try to develop that in the book. I, uh, as I said, uh, I, I do summarize the, the similar arguments by some astronomers and physicists that have been raised mainly in the last couple of decades. I have a, a extensive discussion of a book by a man I admire greatly, uh, uh, Francis Collins, the NIH director. Yeah, it's a wonderful book. <laughs> Human Genome Project. And, uh, and, and I summarize uh, his arguments in a, a book called The Language of God. So it was, it was easier to, to argue an atheist point of view or to raise doubt when we were just looking at the, the anatomical comparisons of the anatomy of different species, both living and uh, fossil. But DNA provided a mechanism for Darwin's uh, evolution for the variation and, and how that arose by changes in the code of DNA. But it also showed us something so complex, so deeply profound that it was clear that it could not have happened, as I said, by unguided chance. It showed that there was purpose behind it and uh, there is something where science then can, can strengthen your faith. And one of the themes of my book is to point out to people who are concerned that science might be the enemy of faith to show that no, it's, it's not uh, contrary, but can be supportive of your faith. Science, uh, as, as I would understand it, does not give us a proof of God, but it does provide us evidence that points to God, that shows us not who God is, but that God is, because there's so many things that we can find the deeper we go into science that are far too complex to have happened by unguided chance. I love that idea, and it gives me similar strength in, in my faith to see that science and even the scientific method is able to show us as you just said, give us strength and confidence in our faith. It doesn't disprove or necessarily prove anything. It um, just provides evidence for a greater creator, a greater divine. And so I really was so hopeful with that message at the beginning. And, and you, you sort of take it, the book, and you give, you structure very <laughs> scientific and well laid out arguments um, kind of from that premise and I find it fascinating that you know, you're a chemist who came into you know, these concepts and these ideas, and only one small aspect of the book is about chemistry or some of these concepts of organic molecules. And it must have been a little daunting to, you know, even with the science background, to want to get into some of these discussions and arguments where you know, physics isn't your, um, is in your area of expertise. You know, geology, paleontology, it just, it was to me such a amazing, you know, outpouring of your curiosity to say, look, I don't 
totally know everything in these areas. And I'll, and I'll admit to you, this is my background, this is my understanding, but I think these are fundamental key points to, to make in order to better understand this, this concept of a you know, greater creator. And, and so, you know, one of the early big ideas that I, I saw from the beginning before some of the, 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 the scientific arguments was just how you spoke to the reader and I immediately was hearing your voice. Lucky for me, I kind of knew what your voice sounded like in, in real life. Um, but I heard this, I heard Jim speaking, and you basically gave everyone permission to read as little or as much of the book as they wanted, as either a scientist or a non-scientist. And I felt freedom with that. It was like, you know, I, I have a pretty strong scientific background, you know, medical background. I feel like I should be able to really understand a lot of the nitty-gritty science, but if I don't, he just gave me permission. You can skip, you know, skip that section. And then even sort of saying, look, there's so many ways to read this book. It's not about chronicle, you know, chronological order. You didn't go from the beginning of time to, you know, our understanding now. It was you know, broken down in a way that you could kind of go between sections. And even, you know, you left your kind of personal beliefs at the end. And I loved actually starting there to sort of see where is he coming from and then kind of going around. But there was so much freedom in the way to, to read this book. And I, and I really resonated with hearing your voice and giving us permission as the, the reader. And, you know, I've, I've read quite a few books and this was probably really the first time I'd ever seen that kind of premise or that permission given. And I was just really curious where, where that came from, you know, was that a, where that idea came from. It was just uh, so authentic and so real to me. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting and, and somewhat ironic uh, in publishing a book, one of the things you do is you have to submit the book for reviews, and we did that. And uh, the first three that came in, two of them were very complimentary, very flattering, and I was very pleased. The third one was somewhat critical, saying that it was a mistake for me to say that I was writing uh, this book about some of the complexity of science and writing it for the non-scientists. But that's the one that I want to understand it. It's yeah. a scientist uh, who has these uh, worries about, uh, frankly, about uh, where science is leading us. And I wanted to show that science is not the enemy of faith, but the ally and can support faith. And uh, in, in this one reviewer said, I, I shouldn't have done that because then what happens when you write something that somebody doesn't understand? Well, I've tried to anticipate that. I, I say in the book that you can start with chapter one or chapter 19. Um, you can, you know, with the introduction, which where I tell you what I'm going to tell you, or you can start with chapter 19 that tells you what I've told you and then go from there. You can select the chapters in any order. And each chapter, I tried to write it as a self uh, sustaining chapter. With, uh, if there are references to material in other chapters, I give you a page number to look at and you go see what it says somewhere else or not. But I, I do say that uh, suppose you get to, to some topic that I'm talking about, like the uh, necessity uh, in reproduction for the male and the female to have the same number of chromosomes that uh, are extremely similar. And I'm raising that as a point of how could you get new uh, families or classes or orders or, or uh, phyla of uh, taxonomic species? How could you get all these higher organizational forms when uh, the individuals reproducing at the beginning would have different numbers of chromosomes? So you get to something like that, and if you don't fully understand it, at the least you can say, well, there's something here that is profound and can't be overlooked. Uh, the same with talking about uh, sugars and amino acids that can be right-handed or left-handed. In the case of uh, sugars, we can synthesize most of them. It's very slow and uh, long-term uh, project to do it with all the uh, equipment that we have in the laboratory. But we can do that, and you get equal amounts of right-handed and left-handed sugars, whether it's glucose or sucrose or ribose or whatever it might be. 
and you and you get equal amounts of left-handed and right-handed. But in nature, there aren't any left-handed sugars. They're all right-handed. And uh, I, I go into the explanation for that, but that's something that's very important to see because uh, it, it causes uh, you to wonder about the purpose, the intent, which implies a, uh, a cause beyond what we can see in nature. And for those of us that are believers, that would be consistent with our belief in God. Yeah, I love... I say to the reader, if, if you get to that point and you see something that is miraculous, but you don't fully understand it, all you have to do is say, wow, and go on to the next. <laughs> this one uh, uh, critic or reviewer was critical of that. Well, I, I respect uh, that point of view. I, I tried my best to write it for the non-scientist, but uh, I, I can't uh, uh, tell you a priori whether I'm that gifted to be able to do that. Each reader will have to decide for themselves. And it may be a passage that I and the reader don't communicate. Or what I'm trying to say doesn't register with the understanding of the reader. And I say, don't worry about that. Just go on to the next paragraph. Maybe you can come back after you've read to the end of the chapter. I also suggest that when, I, when I'm when uh, i signing books, I suggest people, now don't read this all at one sitting. <laughs> if this is something you might want to read one chapter and then put it down and let that sink in and then go to another chapter in any order you like. We'll see how it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> it's... It's great. Um, I think of it as appreciating the complexity or the miracle without needing to know exactly how. Um, and so you can just bask and appreciate uh, the complexity of the idea without needing to, to be ground down into the, to the details if they're, if they're too fine. And um, I love, I want to go into that concept of the left and right-handed sugars. And, but just before we do that, I, I, Wanted to get your thoughts. You mentioned this a little bit earlier, but you know, in my church, I've met quite a few people, and just you know, going through life, the you know, the book of Genesis in the Bible, and well, even just the Bible in general, what what it represents, and but the story of creation as told by Genesis, and you know, everything that we see here on Earth today was was created in seven days and you presented a different interpretation or what what truly is one the bible and then two specifically this the section the book of genesis what really might have been behind this seven days of creation and it was something very new to me to be able to see that perhaps you know, seeing it as poetic and symbolic but actually within the symbolism there were points and evidence possibly for an evolutionary process so both being able to accept that evolution by natural selection and you know creationist events or a great creator you could hold those ideas simultaneously and and uh, i would love to kind of you know get your thoughts you know, as you laid out in the book but um the the ideas behind you know, the bible as a text and specifically the the book of genesis In uh, one part of the book, I, I make this point, and I've done it in in my talks. Uh, I believe that the Bible is the Word of God uh, interpreted through humans who wrote it. And it, it can only incorporate their understanding based on what's available to them at the time and to how they see the way in which the world works. And on the other hand, it uh, would not be correct to say that the Bible is a scientific textbook because it was written long before the scientific method uh, developed and the, the approach that we use in confirming the evidence that we find about nature. Uh, the Bible does not attempt to do that. The Bible is about the relationship between God and humans, uh, the creation uh, of uh, humans and how we relate to God. It uh, does not uh, 
proposed to be uh, subject to the scientific method. Yeah, I um, it just it's fascinating to me to see. You know, I've lived a life where, you know, grew up in a family, and my dad's a physicist. You know, grew up with science. You know, it was my passion in school, and to really be fundamentally thinking. I could explain everything with the scientific method and trying to drive towards certainty or to answers. And it's only been within the last four or five years as I've kind of given into my faith and this process of unknowing or recognizing where you know, questions will always rest. And you can't find a definitive proof or definitive answer or where the scientific method in and of itself is not probably the, the right way to attack a question and I have a, it's given me freedom to kind of balance ways that I conceptualize and think about just our world in general. And I, uh, I really loved, like we mentioned earlier, this concept of chirality, uh, this idea of handedness of molecules. I, I have a chemistry background, so um, perhaps you can explain to us a little bit more about this concept of chirality or handedness and more specifically, you know, why does it matter so much? And you know, what, why do we care that sugars are sort of right-handed and amino acids or proteins are left-handed? Well, you know, does, does it really make a difference? Well, let, let me try. And it's, it's not easy to do with uh, just uh, words for the, uh, the, the average educated non-scientist, and that's why I'm fortunate in the book to have a talented illustrator, our oldest son, Jim Jr., who has some 70 uh, sketches, illustrations that he has created originally for this book, uh, because you need pictures to help you see it. But let's let's go back to uh, saying to the anyone who's watching this, Look at your hands. Your left hand and your right hand are mirror images of each other. They're non-superimposable mirror images. And by that, I mean if you put your palms down and place your right hand on top of your left hand, you'll see that uh, they're not identical in that the right thumb with the palms down, your right hand's thumb is pointing to the left. The left hand's thumb is pointing to the right. They're not mirror images now. The molecular structure of almost all organic compounds, and certainly those that are biologically active, they are asymmetrical like that and, and can be visualized as being non-superimposable mirror images. That's true of all amino acids. And we can, uh, we, we can synthesize amino acids in the laboratory. And just as with sugars, we can synthesize them. And in both cases, we get equal amounts of the left-handed and right-handed form. And yet, in the case of sugars, there are no left-handed sugars in nature. They're all right-handed, the way we define that concept. Uh, and here again, the, the non-scientist who hasn't taken organic chemistry may not be able to fully visualize that on a molecular basis. And, I, and I'll send you some uh, slides that maybe you can incorporate in at this point to show uh, what the mirror images of an amino acid might look like. But in nature, as I said, there are no left-handed sugars. As far as amino acids, there are right-handed and left-handed versions, but only the left-handed amino acids get selected to be incorporated into proteins. Proteins are long polymers of a large number of amino acids. It could be hundreds of them or even thousands of amino acids in a very precise sequence. And one of the curious things is that while there, there could be uh, hundreds of different amino acids incorporated into that polymer of a protein, there are only 22 specific amino acids that get selected. That in itself is uh, an interesting observation. But of those 22, they go in a precise order. 
whether it's glycine or alanine or phenylalanine or tryptophan, whatever it might be, they're in a precise order. They're not randomly scattered. They're selected. And they're selected on the basis of the genetic code that originally was in your DNA. The DNA uh, transcribes this information over to RNA, ribonucleic acid, and the ribonucleic acid has that information from one gene that goes into the selection of the amino acids that go into the protein for a particular protein. Now, there are 23,000 or so uh, proteins in the human body that help us do all the things that we can do, but there each of them is comprised of a precise, defined, genetically defined sequence of these 22 particular amino acids. In addition to that, and complex as that is, the left-handed amino acids are the only ones selected for being incorporated into the polymer sequence of the protein. Only the left-handed version. And uh, that's because the RNA, ribonucleic acid, that selects the amino acids is itself spiraling in a right-handed fashion. Its helix is right-handed, like right-handed screws and nuts and bolts. You go to the hardware store and you you are trying to find a particular size nuts and bolts. They've got them in there organized by size and the nut will of a let's say a, a 10-32 bolt the 10-32 nut will fit right on there backwards or forwards all of those are right-handed you've heard the phrase righty tighty you tighten them by uh, turning them with your right hand in the direction that your fingers go and it put it then threads it in the direction of your thumb. That's a right-handed thread. You won't find any left-handed nuts and bolts in the hardware store because that would be a disaster. People would buy some and they'd get confused and uh, they wouldn't fit. You see, somewhere back at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, someone made a choice that all nuts and bolts and screws, with a few exceptions, would be right-handed. One of the exceptions, for example, is the turnbuckle. It has right-handed threads on one end and left-handed threads on the other, so that when you turn the bar in the middle, it draws the two rods toward the center, and that way holds up your screen door so it doesn't rub along the porch. Uh, so the turnbuckle has both right-handed and left-handed. But other than that particular example, there are very few uh, cases where the threads are left-handed. Your, your uh, propane gas tank is one of those exceptions. I don't know why. Nobody knows why they're <laughs> uh, left-handed, but they are. Maybe it's so you won't attach anything else to it other than the, the fastener that's supposed to go on there. Yeah. <laughs> but, but getting back to this, some, someone or an organization decided we got to have just right-handed nuts and bolts and screws. Well, it's the same thing in uh, this geometry of these biologically active organic compounds. The RNA is right-handed. It selects left-handed amino acids. Sugars are, are biosynthesized in the cell, in, in uh, plant cells, by enzymes that are proteins. And it's these left-handed amino acids in the protein that can only make either the right-handed sugar or the left-handed, and it turns out that they can only synthesize the right-handed ones. Now, right-handed ribose is the backbone of RNA, and it's what causes the RNA to spiral in that uh, right-handed form. So you see, it's like a three-way chicken and egg thing here, and it, it's uh, hard to do it just in words. I wish I had a, a chalkboard here behind me like most professors. <laughs> yeah. But the, the, uh, the three-handed chicken-egg conundrum, you have the DNA and RNA that are right-handed helices, helices. 
because the backbone is a sugar, either ribose or deoxyribose. And because sugars are right-handed, the DNA and the RNA are right-handed helices, like nuts and bolts. The sugars are right-handed because they're made from proteins that are exclusively made of left-handed amino acids. The left-handed amino acids are that way because they were selected by the right-handed RNA. See, it's a three-way chicken egg. Which came first? <laughs> the, the DNA and RNA with all their complexity and they're right-handed or sugars like deoxyribose, that's the backbone of DNA, ribose, which is the backbone of RNA, like all other sugars are right-handed or proteins with the left-handed amino acids. Each one of them requires the others for to be biosynthesized. It can't, it can't be done without the others. And so the answer that I have is not A, B, or C, but D, all of the above. They all had to be there. The DNA and RNA, the ribose and deoxyribose and other sugars, and proteins, including proteins that help synthesize other proteins. They all had to be there in the very first living cell or it would not have been able to reproduce and we wouldn't be here. Now, that's a miracle. That indeed is a miracle. <laughs> I didn't have nice pictures for you to look at. At least you can say, wow. <laughs> I'll try to put a couple images in on our on the podcast page so people can can grasp the visually this concept and to me it i boil it down to the fact that everything in life as i understand it is relational we are relational beings we if we think we can describe through physics chemistry you know any science describe you know our perception of this reality through simply objects or a series of objects. It's, um, it's just simply not going to work. You know, instead, where I see you know, the truth lying is we're all, it's interactions. We're relational beings. You know, we can only hope to describe this world through complex interactions. And nothing really exists without a complementary component and it goes far beyond you know dualistic thinking you know as you just presented here it's not even like black or white it's a b c together um and i've uh, i've really spent some time listening to, to some physicists and you know i mentioned my father you know, many many of these discussions about what exactly are we trying to describe in theoretical physics is it you know, are we trying to describe the existence of a atom this singular object or are we trying to describe interactions between gravity and object forces? And it's only through interactions where I truly believe we'll ever be able to really appreciate and understand perhaps what a greater creator put forth. And um, it's exactly what I hear in this three component description is you know, our relational nature, these, these complex interactions. And you bring up a great point too of this difference between in my mind, complexity versus something that's complicated. And someone, you know, told, I forget exactly where I, I first read this, but you know, a complicated system is one where, you know, it's it's very intricate, but you can actually get down to describe all of its component parts. So take for instance a car engine. To me, it's like I, I really don't know what's going on in a car engine, but there's people out there in ways where you can break it down into all of its component parts and understand and reconstruct it. So I just described you know, the idea of you know, a complicated system, but what we're really describing here through biologic you know, chemical phenomenon is something you know, I refer to as being complex. No matter how reductionist or what, whatever reductionist approach you take, you'll never be able to fully explain all of the interacting in component parts. And to think that we can use a scientific method to try to break down a complex system into those component parts is, is just sort of, it's, it's naive. And so you know, I, I rest 
with peace when I can identify and appreciate complex systems. And, you know, it's great to, through science, to gain a greater understanding of maybe all the things that might interplay in the complex system. But I'm at peace knowing I don't need to fully explain it because it's just not possible. And I'd love to get perhaps your thoughts of you know, that, that dichotomy, that difference between you know, complicated and complex, because I feel like a lot about the book is just elucidating complex systems and allowing us to appreciate their complexity without needing to have to explain every single fine detail. Well, let, let me try. That's an interesting thought. And uh, I don't know that I've uh, fully developed it myself, but certainly here's a, a cut at it. Uh, what we're dealing with as science probes deeper into space in uh, one direction and deeper into the minutia of, of uh, uh, a very small microbic objects and even deeper beyond that into the minuscule dimensions of atoms and the components of atoms. In both directions, we find wonder and majesty and miracle that uh, all of these things could happen. Uh, physicists say, for example, that there are a small number of very important physical constants, like the uh, strong nuclear force constant, the weak nuclear force constant, the electromagnetic force constant, and in particular, the gravity, uh, gravitation constant that are so finely tuned that if any one of them was slightly stronger or slightly weaker, we couldn't be here. Uh, life would not have happened. The illustration that's the easiest to grasp is gravity. Uh, they point out that gravity has a particular value that has been measured very precisely, and its value is, it is uh, crucial and is on a fine knife edge, uh, knife, you know, a sharp edge uh, of uh, value that couldn't be slightly higher or lower. And the point is, if it were stronger, if the gravity constant that attracts masses toward each other, if it was slightly stronger by one part in a hundred billion, although there's not much room for error there, if it were that much stronger, the universe would have collapsed shortly after the Big Bang of creation. If on the other hand, the gravity constant was slightly weaker, say one part in a hundred million. A little bit more room on that side, but not much maybe. But if it were slightly weaker, no stars would have condensed. That is the hydrogen would not have condensed into stars. They would not have had the thermonuclear reaction that has created all of the different elements. We would just be hydrogen. In other words, we wouldn't be talking about this because life could never have happened. It is fine tuned. and. Freeman Dyson, one famous astronomer, made the observation, it's as if at the moment of the Big Bang of creation, the universe knew we were coming because it was finally tuned for life. Well, that, well, that's a relationship that goes way back. And now the deeper we go into molecular biology and we see thousands of different proteins uh, composed of those same 22 amino acids, all of them left-handed, uh, that organize everything in our life, uh, you've got to see there's something relational about that. If we'd had just 10,000 proteins and 10,000 genes that had the code for those proteins, uh, in effect, we wouldn't be here. We, we wouldn't have the intelligence. We would not have had the growth through evolution that gets humans to where we are, sentient beings that are aware of ourselves and that can calculate and forecast, interpret the past as well as the, uh, the future. We can make predictions and test them. All of these because of uh, all of those 23,000 proteins, we couldn't do without them. We would be severely handicapped. But that shows you that 
uh, that vast complexity of of molecular structure has each of these things interrelated. And in particular, that three-way uh, chicken and egg conundrum that I posed of, of, of amino acids, proteins, sugars, and DNA and RNA is a perfect example of that. They all depend on each other. Well, Jim, there's so many other aspects of this book I, I would love to to get into, but I want to make sure to honor the time and also honor yourself as an author to encourage people to go out to get the book themselves to uncover some of these miracles, some of these complexities, and to sit with them in their own reflection and come up with their own ideas and thoughts. I mean, just off the top of my head, there was some fascinating stuff about hemoglobin and chlorophyll and the similar structures and you know how to, if plants could lead to animals and a really great discussion too about some of the laws of thermodynamics and you know, entropy and actually creating order locally but overall globally creating disorder but that being a way to create these organized structures and there's just so many wonderful of scientific points, illustrations, and discussions in this book. And so I want to encourage everyone listening to go out and to get this book and, and, and to see for themselves what it is that they can uncover, either as a scientist or, or non-scientist. For- You're very kind to, to do that, uh, to put in a plug for the book. I, I would appreciate that and, and like to hear back from people. I do have a website. You just have to type in uh, Beaten Path Books. That's one word, B-E-A-T-E-N-P-A-T-H-B-O-O-K-S, beatenpathbooks.com. And uh, you'll see that uh, website, and you can take a look at some of the things in there, see if it might interest you to read the book. While we're at it, I put in a plug for another author. Uh, Francis Collins is the head of the National Institutes of Health was appointed by President Obama and uh, continued by uh, President Trump. Mm. And he is, uh, is still leading, I guess, in his um, eighth year now as a director of the National Institutes of Health. Before that, he was the director of the Human Genome Project that uh, figured out the sequence of code in three billion elements of uh, coding information in uh, human DNA, and now they've done the same with with uh, the code, the, the genome of other species. And he was the head of that uh, magnificent scientific project. He's written a book called "The Language, The Language of God." Think of that. That's a metaphor. The language of God, a metaphor for the code of DNA. Uh, that's an interesting point of view he has, and his, the subtitle of his book is A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief. And I, I think that's one that you might enjoy looking at, and I hope you'll uh, read that and then go to the chemistry in, uh, in my book and see how that fits together. Thank you, Ross. It's been good talking with you. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much, Jim. At the beginning, uh, Dottie and I were around here when you boys are just growing up. Oh, my goodness, yes. <laughs> I, Fighting privileges back in those days. <laughs> out of line, we were, we were known what to say to you. Yeah, I tell people all the time, actually, you know, one of the saddest days of my life um, was finding out I was not actually related to you guys. You weren't really, you know, my aunt and, and uncle. It was, it was worse than finding out about the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. I was, it, was just, it just broke my heart. Um, and then I realized like we could, we could still be, still be friends. And, um, so thank you for, for sharing this conversation and, um, I, uh, can't wait to, to come down to, to see you hopefully in, um, a few short weeks and we can take this conversation to the next level. So. Um. Great. Well, goodbye. Thank you for your presence and willingness to receive a new narrative, a passionate perspective, and perhaps a deeper sense of connection with our collective purpose. 
Please share this podcast with any and all that you believe will benefit from its intention to relieve one's doing and engage one's being. Please share your comments about the conversation on our podcast page and leave a review in iTunes so that the voices in this space can spread to all ears ready to receive it. Music credit goes to Dillingham for their song, Vessel. Remain open, stay curious, and forever be love. You walked on fire And I know you tried